sort of organizing ourselves a bit on the fly tonight. Yeah. Uh, welcome everyone to our first public program of the year, decade, and um, of the series that's called The Institution Overturned. Um, I'm Jana Graham, and this is Anthony Farmelli. Uh, we both work in the Department of Visual Cultures in different ways and um, in different levels of intensity at the moment. <laughs> but we're really excited to be able to present this series, which comes out of our own research um, and also the research of a much larger network, some of the members of which are here with us tonight, and we'll meet throughout the next ten weeks. So um, that, is, that network is called um, the the Network for Research and Institutional Analysis, or it changes names of it. Network for Institutional Network Analysis. Network for Institutional yeah. Analysis. And um, it involves, um, yes, yeah, Susan, I think Susan Kelly's here tonight. Who else is in the network? Paul is <coughs> here tonight, and some other people may join us as well. So this is really research that comes out of quite a, yeah, a collective effort of people who are working in really different kinds of institutions, not all of us are academics, um, some of us have worked a lot in cultural institutions, some of us have worked in um, clinical situations, in art therapeutic situations, um, as artistic practitioners, um, and in a range of other kinds of spaces, housing, charities, etc. So um, we're a kind of heterogeneous bunch and we're happy to sort of share not only the research but also the people in the research with you over the next nine weeks. Yeah, so. Um, the series is on institutional analysis. Tonight's session is called Institutions in Crisis, and we thought we'd just unpack those kind of terms, those two terms, institution and crisis, right at the beginning. And then we're going to maybe just share with you some different histories and insights as to why institutional analysis is an important response to the kind of um, generation of crisis that's taking place right now. Um, and has been for some time um, within the context of neoliberalism, financialization, et cetera. So, and then at the end, we're going to tell you about the series, who's coming, why they're coming, what our commitments were in putting it together, so that you have a sense of, um, yeah, what this is going to be like for a while, and then we'll open up for questions and discussion. <coughs> So institutional analysis, you'll have read on the poster, um, is a tendency and a series of praxis, a series of theories and practices that were built up in um, France originally, but also in the context of Spain, Algeria, Brazil, other parts of the world um, during the post-war period. And so the key figures attached to it, um, as you'll maybe know, are people like Felix Boitari, Franz Fanon. Francois Toscaé, uh, Aida Vasquez, the, the sort of women in the group are lesser discussed. You may not have heard their names as much, but I'm going to say them anyway, because they're nonetheless extremely important. Aida Vasquez, Anne Carrien, Sueli Rolnik, Peter Peltbert, Leanne Moser, and others. So there's, those names might resonate with you for, from different fields and in different practices. Um, and their main kind of point of focus was the analysis and radical response and reshaping of the institution around questions of subjectivity, pedagogy, and political kind of militancy. So um, I guess we wanted to move to just the term institution itself at the beginning. How do people who theorize and practice institutional analysis understand that term institution? Um, because it's not kind of um, maybe as we might come to expect um, the institution as an idea is often sort of the, this kind of space we're in right now, you know, like bricks and mortar and walls, <laughs> and directors above us, and all of the rest. But in in French, and in particularly in the reading of French that were uh, that was undertaken by practitioners and theorists of institutional analysis, the idea of the institution is much more malleable. It's much more of a, a kind of practice of instituting, um, of bringing people together in different kinds of contexts. It's not necessarily the scale of bricks and mortar institution that, that we're talking about when we're talking about an institution. Mm -hmm. you know what yeah, I think the best way to think about <coughs> what an institution is, is anything that institutes forms of sociality. Um, which really means it's completely untethered from any kind of static ideas of buildings and bricks and mortar. You know, um, like colloquially in English, you might hear people talk about like the institute of marriage. M maybe that's a good way of thinking about it, because marriage obviously has little to do with bricks and mortar buildings, um, but it's something that forms a certain type of sociality, a certain type of relation. But that's a relation that's dynamic and can be, should be, reworked 
and, and challenged. So, so that's really, when we st talk about institutional analysis, we're not just talking about what does it mean to be inside of a building? What, what does it mean to be inside your workplace? You know, understanding that workplace. But it's really thinking about what are the social dynamics you know, in play within these spaces? How are types of sociality accepted you know, or, or rejected within them? So that's really what we're concerned with, is the kind of levels of interaction between subjects. And as Guatali said, the institution should be understood as a modeling play. And he took that from um, the psychotherapeutic kind of practice and clubs that he was running at the level clinic where he had um, Giselle Pankow, who was an art therapist who worked with clay, who would come and sort of work with um, people in the institution, work with them to sort of um, re-inscribe or rewrite their roles within the institution via these kind of material practices. So from that, from his observations of that, he described the institution itself, not just the clay, but <laughs> that they were working with, but actually the remodeling and reworking of the institution as a creative practice, as an aesthetic, um, as an aesthetic practice. So that's also really interesting for those of us who are working in the field of visual cultures to understand, you know, that it's not only the, pra the material practices of making, but of making and remaking the institution um, that they're understanding as kind of practices of creativity. So I think one question that, that you hear a lot is, is why do we talk about institutional analysis? Why is it something that we're so concerned with? And, and the, the kind of quick response is, is that institutional analysis, in our mind, formulates a, one of the most dynamic and creative ways to resist forms of crisis. Um, crisis is, is something that a lot of my work, um, quite unintentionally, I, I keep falling back on these ideas of crisis. Because if you think about it, in many ways, our current psychosocial field is 100% structured by you know, crisis. Just think about the way we talk. We have the crisis of Brexit, the crisis of the European Union, the crisis in Iran now, you know, the, the, crisis, the climate crisis. So what we see, you know, the 21st century is the financial crisis. Um, all of these predicated by a massive financial crisis and the rise of global fascism. Um, so one thing that we start seeing here, you know, the 21st century, indeed, I would argue, from 1975 onward, has been marked by this sense of omnipresent crisis. You know, this kind of destabilizing effect that we've had, you know, with the kind of, in the economic sphere, as that relative, you know, kind of radiates out to attack the psychosocial sphere, is one based on insecurity, or one based on precarity, on volatility. Um, in other words, it's one based fundamentally on this kind of omnipresent sense, this kind of pervasive sense of crisis. In other words, crisis is no longer the exception, but crisis is the rule. And part of this means that as subjects within, the kind of, within this kind of psychosocial environment, in order to safeguard yourself, you come up with all kinds of little microfascisms, you know, all kinds of ways of securitizing your own subject, you know, in order to ground yourself in some way. You know, but the absolute like basis for any work, especially in mental health, um, which is my own background, you know, comes from this understanding of what is crisis, how do we respond to crisis, how do we contain crisis, how do we work through crisis. Um, and this cannot be separated from what's often referred to as neoliberalism or integrated world capitalism. You know, the dissolution of the Bretton Woods system in 75, which put into place a system of desired volatility within the you know, global economies. Something that was radically accelerated in the 1990s, you know, with the so-called kind of unipolar moment. You know, if you look at a draft of these kind of boom and bust economies, um, you know, every year the, the cycle gets smaller and smaller. You know, so we're constantly living through almost a kind of a revolutionary moment where everything is burning just so it can be rebuilt over and over again. You know, and this very much kind of dictates the psychosocial landscape. Yeah, and so, um, the, so there's these kind of like macro tendencies, I suppose, but there's also like the lived experience of crisis, which is, um, you know, the, the intricate ways in which our everyday lives are um, bio-financialized, are, are built into financial kinds of systems and structures. 
Um, and just thinking about that in relation to the university, for example, where, um, you know, lecturers, we, when we were on strike recently, we started to talk to lecturers about their own levels of debt, actually, and um, the degree to which student loans are kind of carried into this moment that we're living in now, even if people studied 20 years ago, the way our debt is tied into the debt of our students, you know, and the fact that these regular boom-bust cycles that take place, or not even boom, just bust cycles that take place at the university that create these kind of frenzies, like this time of year, for example, we're always told that there's a budget crisis and that's always the reason for us to kind of panic to sort of stop what we're doing and start thinking about recruiting and start thinking about this or that. So there's this kind of like panicked subject subjectivity, subjectivation that's created through this kind of endless um, crisis. And there's two significant ramifications of this for subjectivity, I mean many, but there's two I wanted to talk about. Um, and um, one is, is just thinking about the way that this, the crisis, um, or crisis as a mentality and as a tendency, produces both the problem, um, the narrative, the narration of the crisis, and its solution. So if you think of something like social housing, um, or housing as a crisis, the problem of social housing is produced <coughs> by the funding of, of housing. The narration of that is that the councils or whomever has no money, they have no money, there's no way to produce social housing apart from if we um, partner with real estate speculators if, uh, and that that is the resolution. So it's like a total system that reinforces itself and there's so many of these kinds of forms of narration within the crisis that are already occupied, and it's already narrated. And this is, will come to be important when we start to talk about institutional analysis as a mode of enunciation, uh, a collective enunciation of conditions that are much more based in experiences than in the narrations of, say, corporations, councils, and governments of the problems that are facing us, for which they've already prescribed a solution. And this, um, this becomes kind of, you know, also part of the depression we experience and the feeling that we can't get out of it. Um, the, other, the other thing about crisis is that as a mode of subjectivation, it literally takes up all of our time. So the temporality of crisis is such that, you know, we're running from one thing to the next. Um, we're having to produce an answer to this question, solve that problem. Our health care is, you know, inadequate. We have to go find an, an analyst outside of the health care system. We have to go and run and find uh, a solution to the budgetary crisis of our university. We have to deal with the demographic slump that took place of um, young people <laughs> 20 years ago that's now, you know, facing us. So all of these things are kind of coming to bear on our everyday realities, which we live in a kind of general state of panic and moving from one thing to the next, trying to solve all, solve all of these issues as they emerge. We become reactive to them instead of sort of um, able to kind of cope and build projects over a long term. This is ramifications, of course, when we, as workers, um, but also as ramifications for social movements. You know, as we try and build resistances and modes of resistance, um, we find it increasingly difficult to actually even form a meeting. You know, like I'm on a WhatsApp group for a particular uh, social uh, movement group, and literally every message is, I can't make that meeting, we can't, I can't make it, I can't make it, I can't, you know, it's this kind of, um, you know, really a blockage around being able to make the time for resistant activity. And so these, this is also something that we think that institutional analysis speaks to, and um, we'll say why now, I think, right? Yep. <laughs> so, so, one thing that's really interesting about the discourse of institutional analysis is there's two key concepts, at least in my mind, that bear um, scrutiny. The first is crisis, and the second is resistance. Um, as it kind of historically, institutional analysis was birthed in probably the two greatest global crises um, of the 20th century, colonial domination, colonial empire, and the Second World War. So just to give you a bit of the history, so during the Spanish um, Civil War, there was this radical, he was known as the Red Psychiatrist, Francois Tosquet. So Tosquet was a member of the kind of anarchist Marxist party um, for workers' unification. And the party itself, you know, he was radically working in the vanguard there, trying to undo a lot of the, what he called war neurosis and treating people on the front lines. Once it came clear that Franco's fascist um, party was going to win the war. Tosquet found himself in a refugee camp on, um, in France. It was in the refugee camp when Tosquet claimed that he did the best psychiatric work of his life. So working very much on the fly, 
with no one else who was trained in mental health, he started setting up clinics within the refugee camp. <coughs> started absolutely revolutionizing the treatment of the people suffering from what today we would call post-traumatic stress disorder. During this time, he made a bit of a name for himself and way on the other side of France, in a small town of San Alban, um, there was a small psychiatric hospital and the director, Lucien Bonafé, heard about the work that Tosque was doing and kind of plucked him out of the refugee center and moved him over to the hospital. That move happened just before the Nazi invasion. So during occupation, this notion of confinement, of crisis, became incredibly important um, for the work that they were doing in the hospital. Now, quite famously, um, during Vichy, you know, Vichy rule in France, about 80% of all psychiatric patients either died of starvation or were sent for extermination. There's one hospital where no one died, and that was San Alban. So what they did in San Alban was they quite literally broke down the wall between them and the village. They integrated themselves into the daily life of the village. But more than that, they became a staging area for the resistance. So quite a few kind of notable surrealist artists that couldn't escape, um, like Tristan Zara, ended up taking refuge in San Alban for the war. They ran a resistance newspaper out of the hospital. They sheltered resistance fighters. Um, they staged attacks out of the hospital. But all of this while integrating the patients' lives with the lives of the village. Shortly after um, the war ended, Tosquet took on two junior doctors, kind of interns. One was Jean Uri, and the other, a little bit later, was Franz Fanon. It was at this moment um, when the practice that they had been doing, kind of very much on the fly, they always talked about how it's phenomenological, as in, first we do, then we think. <laughs> you know, like, like, first we do this, oh, this is working, let's try to theorize it later. It was at that time when they started kind of in a more robust way thinking about what they were doing, and they called it institutional psychotherapy. This was the birth of what was known as the institutional psychotherapy movement. Shortly before Fanon left San Alban, a very, very young Felix Guattari, who was only 15 at the time, um, comes there to do an internship um, at the suggestion of his teacher, Fernand Uri. Um, Fanon went off and became Fanon that we know of, that kind of anti-colonial, decolonial militant. But the trajectory of Fanon, one thing that I think a lot of people tend to forget is he was always, first and foremost, a psychiatrist and first and foremost a practitioner of institutional psychotherapy. When he went to Bleed at Joinsville, the social therapy projects that he instituted there were 100% lifted from the work he did with Tosquet. When he saw that it wasn't culturally appropriate for a lot of the Arab men, you know, so he had two basic wards. One was Arab men, and the other was European women. You know, then he adapted the treatment for the kind of local population, but always in this mind of how do we work outside of the hospital? How do we work with culture and through culture in order to speak to our patients? You know, always taking in line with the work that he did initially with Tosque. Um, later on, he went to Tunisia at the Hospital Charles Nicole. It was there that he instituted Africa's first day center and radically expanded the work in social therapy and institutional psychotherapy that he did with Tosca. So this is important. The entire time he was a militant, the entire time he was fighting, he was also a practicing psychotherapist. And his approach to politics was always informed by this. The other trajectory um, is Jean Uri. After leaving San Alban, um, shortly after leaving San Alban, he came into a bit of an inheritance and bought a uh, chateau, um, Labor, that he started as its, its own psychiatric clinic when he recruited Felix Guattari to work with him. So it was there that I think most of the work in institutional psychotherapy came to be known. But as present as the politics were for Fanon's work, they were equally present in the work in Labor Clinic. Um, famously, they were a shelter and refuge for anyone who didn't want to fight in the Algerian War of Independence. They staged protests, you know, planned protests, I should say, out of the clinic against the war in Algeria, 
later on, <coughs> many members um, of the board were very active in the 68 uprising. Um, more on that in a minute. <laughs> and, and, you know, so in other words, you know, the Guatari and others work on the new left movement. You know, there's always a kind of political engagement. Psychiatry, for them, always had to be political. I, I think jean Lodi said it best. Um, he said, the hospital is ostensibly a microcosm of society, and the hospital is sick. So before we can go about curing our patients, we must first cure the hospital. This was something explicitly taken into politics, too. When you read Guacari's work from as early as 62, 63, he was talking about the way crisis has infected left-wing political movements. You know, and that before the movements can have any kind of, you know, be able to formulate any kind of active resistance, they first had to cure themselves as social movements. Um, talk about the grid? Not just the activity, like yeah. the activity. Yeah. Um, it was this time that a lot of really interesting work happened. So, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Guatari's notion of transversality. But the thing is, and one criticism leveled against Guattari, especially in his collaborations with uh, Gilles Deleuze, you know, is, is how untethered it is from reality, you know, how abstract it is. And, and that's something that personally I have a massive problem with. Because if you actually really read Guattari's writing in line with his practice, all of it was related to what he was doing. Um, so this is a perfect example. This is the grid. So. As we know in most hospitals, um, <coughs> most psychiatric clinics, you know, there, there's a quite rigid hierarchy. You know, you have the doctors, you have orderlies, you have nurses, um, then you have the patients. You know, everyone has their very rigid, fixed job. So, at one point, Uri talked about <coughs> this. He said, the problem is, is that doctors and hospitals are married to the state. And the state then dictates the form of kind of management that they'll have. So what the doctors are in fact doing is instituting the very sickness of the state into their patients. You know, the cure is making them worse. So in order to break away from this, Watari developed the grid. The grid was a way of reorganizing tasks and labor at the clinic. Um, this is what it looked like, but basically, it was a fairly complex system where all the people who worked there, including all the patients, were listed. And then you would kind of cycle through all the tasks. What that meant in practice is you would have patients helping work reception, you would have patients helping with consultation, introducing patients to, a to the doctors, things like that, and you would have psychiatrists scrubbing toilets. Um, all of this was meant to radically disrupt the kind of hierarchical relations. So we're not talking about a kind of vertical form of organization, nor a strictly horizontal, but a transversal. A line of work that cuts across all these different roles. And by cycling through this kind of transversal grid, you know, the idea then is your kind of rigid subject position becomes destabilized. You know, and in breaking down the subject, you can start going about the process of kind of resisting these kind of micro-fascisms that form within the hospital. You know, and through that resistance, you know, a kind of curative property can be found. Think you want to go about sure, yeah. education? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that's something like just to kind of pick up on that. The so while the institutional hierarchies or the roles, the kind of definitions of roles, um, is destabilized in processes of institutional analysis, there's a kind of um, also degree of stabilization in terms of holding space and time to conduct um, analysis to of uh, analysis of the institutional conditions, but also to provide sort of supports for the groups that are engaging in institutional analysis. So in some ways, sometimes when you talk about this kind of um, disrupting and rendering unstable the roles, you think, okay, but we already live in unstable times. What does that mean? What are the and there's a lot of resistance and fear around that. But actually, one of the things that um, that institutional analysis provides is kind of an alternative way of sort of um, occupying the time of the institution. 
um, so that one can engage in kind of more support, collective support mechanisms, collective um, modes of enunciation around the conditions that are produced by these various roles and hierarchies. So Uri um, uh, Ferdinand Uri, who is the, the educator of the two Uri brothers, um, and Aida Vasquez, who's a Venezuelan psychoanalyst and a student at one point and then became the co-author of one of um, the significant book that the two of them wrote together, which was on institutional pedagogy. They together say, um, we prefer to evoke the power of perennial plants that grow roots amongst the stones of old walls, happy cracks. We are no, in no hurry to patch it up. We continue against the winds and tides, wordy, stubbornly, where we are, where we try to change, and this is what jeopardizes the order. So it's the process of holding space and time that actually is what jeopardizes the kind of order that takes place. This is something we learned quite, um, uh, unfortunately, in some ways, in the crisis of our own department that took place three years ago when our dear friend and colleague Mark died and his memorial lectures tomorrow night, but I thought it important to sort of mention him because he was also really committed to this um, history and the ideas within institutional analysis. Um, but also it was something in the wake of his death as a department we um, faced a crisis, you know, and we had to really think about how um, the institution was making us ill in particular ways and how other forms of collectivity were absolutely <coughs> crucial actually, they were, they were um, life and death kind of situation and how we needed to really think about that and one of the biggest issues for us was how we were going to hold time and space in the face of all of the um, demands that were being made on us, how we were going to push away those demands such that we could hold those spaces, um, which we continue to do in various kinds of groups um, and that, that sort of form are formulating themselves in, in, in very subtle ways, um, marking and disrupting kinds of the order of, of affairs that had been before. I think there's a number of processes like that at play at the university right now. <clears throat> Something like the gold paper, which was started nearly 10 years ago, but which is, um, you know, has brought to the fore various issues around um, mental health, around housing, uh, around the governance of the institution, which continues to meet and continues to hold space around these questions and sort of push um, uh, the analysis, but also the action and the transformations in different ways. Um, something like the strike, you know, the moment of a, of a strike can also be a moment of reconfiguring relationships precisely because it holds space and time um, outside of the kind of dominant demands that crisis performs on us and on our bodies. So I think this is um, just important to sort of think about um, uh, both the dimension of destabilization, but also sort of providing some kind of other forms of, I guess, stabilization in a way um, that is through the practice of analysis. So, in terms of institutional pedagogy, so one of the one of the tangents, I suppose, of institutional analysis, one of its practices, is, is institutional psychotherapy that um, that Anthony has been talking about. But the other um, tendency, I suppose, or the other set of practices, came from educational settings. So, um, <coughs> under the under the heading institutional pedagogy. So, um, in, in institutional <coughs> pedagogy, I mean, the book on institutional pedagogy was written by um, Vasquez and Uri, in Ferdinand Uri, in 1967, so it's a little bit later. But it was really based on um, Ferdinand Uri's uh, kind of inhabitation of a particular history of radical education that took place in um, France. Uh, it started in the 1920s. It was started by a couple, um, Celestine Fanet and Louise Fanet, who worked together initially to set up a cooperative union of teachers, of, um, of primary school teachers in the 20s. So they were communists, but they were, um, co they were interested in um, a cooperative union, so one that wasn't necessarily um, within the communist party structure, but one that was articulating itself in a kind of alternative framework, nonetheless communist. So <laughs> they, they had various frictions at various times with the official communist party, um, which, which didn't always like the form of education that they were working with, but, um, but nonetheless they, they were really committed to social movements, committed activists, um, committed resistors during the war. Um, and they were, they originally, I mean, some of the earliest kind of ideas of institutional pedagogy for the Flenets, so this is like sort of many years before Ferdinand Uri enters into the picture, is that they are, um, um, oh, sorry, I just like lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah, that they're thinking about um, 
you know, traveling and sort of building up from the history of radical education. So they're thinking, they're reading John Dewey, they're sort of thinking about their, the history of the Paris Commune and the educational experiments of the Paris Commune. And they also go to visit um, uh, Nadezhda Krupskaya, Lenin's wife, who was the um, assistant commissar of education during the sort of post-revolutionary period in Russia. So she, um, Krupskaya, has written amazingly 11 volumes on radical pedagogy, one of which has been translated into English, and her, her work is generally considered to be the wife of Lenin much more so than, than this amazing body of education writing that she, that she did in that period. They met with her, and, and what was happening in the sort of theorization of the school at that point in, in the Russian experiment was um, that they were attempting to um, produce schools that were based on these different kinds of working committees of people who were structuring students and teachers and community members working on these kind of councils to construct different dimensions of the school. And in her writing she talks about, um, and I think this is also really important, she talks about um, social reproduction, she doesn't use that word obviously, or that term, but she talks about the social dimension, social reproduction, that the rebalancing of roles between genders as a really crucial dimension of this, such that the theoretical work, maybe the more skill-based or training work of the school, be um, on equal level with the maintenance, repair, and care work of the school. So this is a really important kind of um, way in which she started to articulate and others started to articulate um, education in Russia, which then got carried into the Frenet's work. And they started to develop these um, uh, schools. In pri they were primary schools, predominantly in rural areas, where there was you know, not a lot of funding and not a lot of interest in what was going on. And they developed these um, uh, sort of experimental sites where they were playing with all kinds of different ideas and different practices. Um, some of them, I mean, the most well-known thing about the Fane schools, I should say also, they started with about 12 schools um, in, in the 1920s. By the 1950s, there were 5,000 schools in, um, in France, primary schools, who were operating. So it was a relatively large scale, compared to things like radical education projects, say, like Summerhill, in the UK, which is often described, but was this very small private school in rural yeah. southern England. Um, you know, it, it definitely gets a lot of airplay, but this was a much bigger and much more state, it was within the state system, it was within the state schools that they were able to develop this kind of level of experimentation. So what were they doing in the experimentation? They had a few different kind of techniques. Um, one of them, and the most famous one, was the um, introduction of a printing press into every school. So the children in the schools would um, form essentially collectives through which they would start to um, develop newspapers, develop collective forms of writing and publishing to articulate the conditions of their experiences in their local area, their local community. They'd bring members of the community into the discussions that would, would come into their newspapers. Prior to that, they had a number of other um, practices that they engaged with. One was called the free text. The free text was literally where um, you know kids could come into a classroom and they could write or say anything, and the teachers would either <coughs> describe you know what was happening in their lives, they would describe what they observed, and they would learn to to read and write by virtue of transcribing those experiences into the printing press. Um, another thing, another kind of um, practice that they developed, and this is for much more further developed in the institutional pedagogy in the 1950s, later 50s and 60s, was um, the, what they called the quad neuf. The what's new every so every morning you would say what's new <laughs> and it would be an open space where sort of um, both the concrete material you know realities of their everyday lives could register but also the fantasies you know the fantasy lives of the children and of the teachers could register and, and be sort of analyzed and worked through and discussed so some other pedagogical thing, tools like um, circle time, which is a much more regular thing to find in primary schools, come out of this, these kinds of spaces that are extra to the curriculum, spaces for reflection and um, kind of analysis of conditions. The other, um, other thing that um, comes a little bit later also are the, the kind of idea of a mini monograph of writing about different kinds of institutional conditions. The students were experimenting in many different ways. So they would be forming uh, collectives around the printing press, but there'd also be a collective that would be growing food for the school. Another collective of students would be um, busy doing repair work in the school. Another group of students and teachers might be thinking a bit more about the curriculum. So they were developing through these various school councils and then a council of councils how to run the school in these various collective ways. So they had a lot to kind of also reflect on, basically, because of the engagement um, and the kind of level of um, 
you know, sort of uh, experimentation, but also knowledge production that was taking place through this. The pamphlets that they made on the printing press and the newspapers, they, they took the place of textbooks in the school. So it was also like a rejection of state um, dictates of education, state curriculum. So their, their curriculum then became, their textbooks became these little pamphlets and little books. One of them um, that I saw was called uh, the Book of Life. So children <coughs> would have books about their own lives, which they would share, but also the Book of Our Lives, which would then look at the intersecting kind of, um, they would be things that the subsequent years of students could go back to and sort of um, work with and sort of think through. And these are really interesting uh, you know, techniques and strategies to even think about in our work in the university. Um, and so a number of different uh, ideas sort of came out of this, um, these practices for Aida Vasquez and for Nanuli, who were interested in, in very much the way in which there was a kind of freedom to these spaces where one could explore the psychic dimension of the institution, of the classroom, where fantasies, desires, anxieties could actually register and be worked through and sort of theorized in their terms. And these mini monographs, they call them institutional monographs, would be forms of, um, of writing that people could engage with around their experiences and, and what these other kinds of free spaces produced. So they, um, uh, in, the, in, sort of in the 60s, early 60s, they started to take these um, practices into secondary schools and into Paris. And this was like a real point of contention with the movement. It had become you know, a significant movement at that stage and that people weren't quite sure that it should be in urban settings or if it should go to secondary schools. But nonetheless, they kind of continu continued on with that and developed this idea of a, of a particular uh, way of doing institutional analysis. That they really highlighted this kind of psychic dimension of the analysis. So that was there in the earlier days in the Fene movement, but with primary school students, there was a lot more kind of activity. You know, the, the, the emphasis was on the activity, on the techniques. Whereas when it got taken into um, institutional pedagogy in the urban centers and the secondary schools, the kind of point of the um, ana analytic component became uh, much more pronounced. So, yeah, that's, I think that's all I need to say about that. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that, that we're trying to kind of tease out of this. So, so right now we have basically kind of three large concepts, right? Or we have two movements, institutional pedagogy and institutional psychotherapy. And then the methodological approach would be called institutional analysis. So this is something that runs through both movements. Um, one thing that's really clear from both the work in education and psychotherapy is that institutional analysis is fundamentally concerned with two things. Um, social alienation and psychic alienation. You know, in this way they come back to almost a kind of traditional Marx-Freudian analysis. Although it's a kind of Marxism and a Freudian, Freudian psychoanalysis that has very little relation to the masters. Um, and in fact, I would say that they promote a certain kind of infidelity to the masters. You know, <laughs> like a way that, that you know, quite happily move away from Marx, quite happily move away from Freud. But they were primarily concerned with how are we alienated from society, and how then is the psyche alienated from itself. You know, so both in psychotherapy and education, they were trying to address this double this, this problem of double alienation. What becomes really interesting um, is the moment when these practices moved out from the schools and moved out from the hospitals. So. In 67, beginning of 68, more 67, um, there was Anne Kidian. She was an intern at Labor. She studied sociology um, under Henri, I always say his surname wrong, Lefebvre. 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 Uh, the sociologist whose name I can never pronounce. <laughs> Lewis, Jim Lewis isn't here. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so she was trained as a sociologist. Uh, she came to work as an intern at Labor, uh, worked very closely with uh, Felix Guattari, with Jean Uri, Jean Claude Pollock. And then with Guattari and others, um, Francois Pan being one of them, they formed first the Fergie, the Federation for Research um, in Institutional and Education which became a kind of large umbrella for different small um, working groups. The main one, the most important one, would be the CERFI, the Center for Research in Institutional Life. Um, 
this was the moment when they started taking these techniques and applying them to urban studies, applying them to sociology, working within especially <coughs> rural communities. Um, a lot of Anne's really groundbreaking work was in areas where there were high rates of suicide amongst farmers. So working in these rural communities with the farmers to try to see how relations could be rearranged in order to make it a more sustainable kind of community. Um, and Leanne Moser went, went, uh, was working more in uh, sort of care centers with children mm -hmm. and their um, caregivers around sort of the the uh, pathologizing of, um, of young children who were from inner city and working class families. So she started to try and rearrange those relationships and the kinds of ways in which that institutional framing of the children was affecting the kind of care that they were being given. Um, and also worked on issues to do with the kind of the workers' conditions themselves. So there were many different kinds of experiments. And um, some of them go back to, sorry, I forgot one thing about the funny movement that I wanted to say, which is just that, um, you know, where the pedagogy um, dimension of this was really, it was, it was within the school, but it was also very much about um, transforming and including the outside of the school within and also producing these kind of networks of, um, of um, exchange between schools from different communities. So there was a kind of way in which the, it wasn't about the kind of the enclosure of the school as a space, it was constantly about creating these other kinds of lines and relationships with um, spaces that weren't the school. And they describe this as um, techniques for living otherwise. And this is also why they came into quite a lot of conflict with the Communist Party, because the, the party's pedagogy at the time was very much about producing revolutionary, the subjectivity of revolutionary workers. And they were talking about changing work entirely, so <laughs> changing work to be the, um, the sort of um, production of living otherwise. So this was like a, you know, a kind of a small shift, but I think it really informed also when they went out into urban centers, into rural areas, that this kind of idea of, of techniques for living otherwise um, were, were quite crucial and kind of underpinned a lot of that work as well. I think the politics, too, is, is worth highlighting again at this point. Um, you know, for example, a lot of the members of Serfi, especially Anne Kirin, um, Anne was one of the <coughs> central, yeah, well, she wasn't even a student anymore. She had just finished her studies, which yeah. was a bit of a controversy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she was one of the I central, agitator. yeah, but one of the central organizers of the March 22nd movement. That would be the student movement in Nanterre that really their occupation of the Renault factory um, helped kick off what we know now as May 68 uprising in Paris. Um, Watari, you know, was a little bit pensive at first, but then he was running daily on his motorcycle between Labor and the Sorbonne and the occupation there. They were involved in occupying kind of quite famous theaters in Paris. But all of this was this idea of how do we then kind of rework social forms? You know, you know, how within the movement do we kind of function on these kind of transversal ideas? And even prior to 68, like for Nanori, when, when Guattari came into contact with him, he was um, uh, involved in the, the youth hosteling movement, mm -hmm. which was producing really interesting sites for young people who had recently graduated from secondary school or even younger than that, to go and visit different communities um, through this hosteling network. But at each, each hostel, there were all of these kind of, again, radical experiments in group subjectivity, in, pa in printmaking, pamphlet making together, um, developing all of these ways of, of being together otherwise, I suppose. So, um, so this is, you know, again, it kind of was the precursor to 68. We often, when we hear about 68, it's like it was a spontaneous eruption or something like that. <laughs> but actually, when you think of the sort of 50 years of uh, radical pedagogy and institutional analysis that preceded it and sort of informed it to some extent, or at least some of its practitioners, I think it it's, um, helps us to think about the temporalities <coughs> of the response to crisis as not being reactive, but as actually being ongoing. Um, works of an analysis and transformation. I think one last thing that I think is really important to highlight, or a couple things that are important to highlight, mm -hmm. is often this gets confused with a lot of other discourse, or, or kind of clumsily lumped in to other movements. So it's really important to say this is not um, anti-psychiatry. <laughs> that this is not what was happening um, in Italy. It's not what was going on here with Lang and Cooper. Um, whilst there were conversations <coughs> happening 
you know, and, and kind of certainly lines of communication between all the different anti-psychiatry movements and institutional psychotherapy, they have a fundamentally different approach. Um, whereas anti-psychiatry, in a little way, wants to smash the institution. Um, the idea of institutional analysis, institutional psychotherapy, is the institution is necessary. It keeps you bound, you know? W without the institution, you would quite literally go kind of flying off into the bound of psychosis. So what they, they don't want to smash it. They want to radically rework it from the ground up. You know, but the institution is something that's absolutely necessary. You can't just get rid of it. You know, Guattari was quite explicit in this in his critique of Lang that Lang's work was inherently dangerous. Um, you know, and fundamentally not going to produce any lasting therapeutic results. <coughs> if you ever read his essay on Mary Barnes. Um, and then the other thing that we were thinking about that might be useful and we'll kind of take up in subsequent weeks, um, which might be of interest to those of you who are working from the perspective of like the cultural sector or the arts discourse, <laughs> which is how this maybe differs from institutional critique or what's been recently just called new institutionalism or radical institutionalism. There's a lot of trends uh, right now around using of the term institution. And, um, you know, many people have already sort of gone through the history of institutional critique and men made many critiques of it. I mean, one of which is that the institution of critique becomes an institution itself. Another, <coughs> that um, the ins institutional critique talks about sort of going away from the institution, uh, per performing a sort of outside, which kind of doesn't exist in our current configuration of um, situations, that the inside-outside binary doesn't really hold. Um, uh, because there's a lot of kind of flows in between different kinds of spaces, different kinds of practices, and cultural institutions. <coughs> um, one of the, the things that I find most troubling about, um, especially books like Radical Institutionalism by Claire B Bishop, or the idea of new institutionalism, is that they're primarily narrated by the directors um, as their vanguard kind of gesture of a um, sort of change. And very little and very infrequently is it ever um, is there ever an examination of the micro-political, uh, transversal kinds of relations that institutions of culture are embedded in. So um, you know we we really can't take directors' word for it anyway that the, the, these changes have taken place. And any of us who have lived through the experience of a radical declaration of institution new institutionalism will know that the um, the actual experience on the ground is very different from that. And all, but the other thing that's really important, I think, is um, also for, the, for institutional historiography, for, pe for people who are um, reading about the histories of institutions, which also are narrated by predominantly um, the radical gestures of directors, rather than the multiple constituencies and the polyvocal articulations of, um, of, cultural, of cultural institutions, of cultural experiences. So this is something I think that um, for me as somebody who's like worked in cultural institutions and studied them and you know, tried to understand why they create um, subjectivities of deep anxiety <laughs> and, um, and often feelings of uh, you know really intense bodily dissatisfaction <laughs> and um, terror in some cases you know that one of the reasons for this is that we've never developed adequate tools for analyzing um, the ways in which they articulate themselves multiply um, that we've also erased the um, the stories the ideas and the experiences of all of those who have crossed their thresholds in the process and this is also um, a, a kind of question and as we reformulate and rethink how cultural institutions need to articulate themselves to kind of attend to the urgencies of our time, it feels like we need to really think about um, uh, this kind of institutional, institutional analysis as a practice. And some cultural institutions have started to do this work, and we'll be hearing in week uh, nine from some of the people who are sort of really thinking about the tacit knowledges and the kind of also the microviolences <laughs> of, of cultural institutions as they are today. I think one thing about the program, we wanted to kind of talk about what we're trying to do with the program now. Um, yeah, yeah, then open it up. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're all bored of hearing our voices now. Um, so one thing that, that we really believe is, you know, to really understand the work, you know, you know, often Deleuze and Guattari's schizo analysis is thrown around, you know, and as is the work of Franz Fanon. But to have a really robust understanding of these, you know, starts with an understanding of the work they did in institutional analysis. And beyond that, 
to think about how this can inform our current practices, you know, our current institutional practices, creative practices, work within mental health. So we tried to organize a program that will try to speak to a lot of this. So next week we're going to have the filmmaker, Francois Pan. Francois was at Labor um, for a number of years and was a member of the Serfi. While he was at Labor, he filmed several documentaries. So he's going to be here next week to do a screen of two short films, uh, Reflections on the War with Min Burka, and then an interview he uh, made with Jean Udi. Um, with uh, Francois will be Rachel Wilson. Uh, Rachel, some of you might know her, is a Goldsmiths Visual Cultures alumni. <laughs> um, but she's also currently working as a Recovery Opportunities Coordinator um, in a mental health service. Um, operated by the charity SHP, and she's another member of um, our network for institutional analysis. The week following that will be Andy Goffey. So Andy Goffey is an um, <coughs> associate professor at the University of Nottingham. He has translated a lot of Guattari's work, most significantly and impossibly. Um, he translated schizoanalytic cartographies <coughs> as well as lines of flight. Andy's work is often situated, kind of, he has two focuses in a lot of work. He does a lot of work in media philosophy, but also you know, institutional psychotherapy in a very robust way. So he'll be presenting his new work on Jean Uri and the clinical experience. The week following that, <laughs> we have Anne Kieran coming. So Anne, as we mentioned before, um, was foundational in Serfi. She worked at Labor. Uh, she was instrumental in the 68 uprisings. So she's going to be here presenting the work that they did at Labor, specifically <coughs> around the formation of clubs, you know, the, the different therapeutic clubs within the clinic. Following that, we have Sophie Mendelssohn. She's a psychoanalyst and a lecturer at Perry Wheat. Um, this one will be quite interesting um, session because there was recently, I'm not sure who here would be familiar with this, but there was a bit of a kick up in Paris a few months ago where there was an open letter signed by 80 quite well-respected psychoanalysts denouncing the move to decolonize universities. Um, reading the letter, it's fairly vulgar. You know, it says that decolonization is always racist against white people. <laughs> you know, it's you know, the kind of stuff you'd expect from like an alt-right troll, but which is why it's really shocking who signed it. Um, you know, including you know, people who work with Fanon. Um, so Sophie, is, along with Valentin Scalpani, wrote a response to this letter. And, and she's doing a quite robust work um, in Paris at the moment on the idea of the post-colonial unconscious in decolonizing psychiatry. So she'll be here and in conversation with our own kind of department decolonization working group talking about these, you know, the different processes and the different kind of lessons to be learned from what's happening in Paris versus what's happening here. And this is like one of the, I guess, ideas of the program is that at least at a couple of points, if not every single week, we reflect also on the institution we're in, as well as, you know, some of the other kinds of spaces that I know students and other people who will be attending the lectures are from, so that we'll, we'll have, this session will be quite focused on the university as a site of institutional analysis and um, we'll have a session later that's more on cultural institutions so we have these two that are kind of focal, focal points but of course any of the other institutional inhabitations people have will be welcome in the discussion um, yeah. then um, the one that we're really excited about or especially excited about I should say we're excited about all of them <laughs> um, but they're, they're quite the coup for us uh, is then we have uh, Mediel Fanon Mendez France <coughs> Um, Franz Fanon's daughter and the director of the Fanon Institute. So she'll be here presenting um, work on decolonial psychiatry and ethnopsychiatry social therapy. Um, right, then the week after, we're, um, we have Laurence Roussel coming, who's part of the network um, based in Brussels. And Laurence 
is, um, and I think this is quite an important kind of um, perspective to bring in because one of the things that's very under-articulated within this whole field is a kind of feminist perspective and also the, um, the ways in which feminist kind of pedagogies and ideas might um, intersect with a lot of what's happening within an institutional analysis. And in Laurence Rassel's work, she was from a feminist hacker group um, uh, and has now um, become the director of a cultural, uh, sorry, an, an art school in Brussels. And she's been using sort of these strategies we've been talking about, about school councils and ways of reworking the institution um, within her art school. And she sort of reads the institution as code. You know, she sort of talks about, you know, from a feminist hacker perspective um, and an institutional analysis perspective, you come to this idea that the, the institution is a kind of code that can be reworked, which is very much in keeping with this modeling clay idea that, um, that comes out of institutional analysis. Uh, the week after that, we have um, a week on institutional pedagogy, so some of the things that I was talking about but going into more detail. And Ed Thornton, who's um, done a lot of uh, work on the, on the <coughs> histories and the philosophical kind of base for institutional pedagogy is coming. Um, and so is Vandele Santos. Vandele is... Um, well, it's interesting what he will bring because he, he's a um, uh, psycho practicing psychologist, but he studied at the Nucleo in Sao Paulo. In Sao Paulo, um, unfortunately, we can't represent what's happening in Brazil in the series because we tried several times to get a lot more money than we had, and we just couldn't. So, so unfortunately, our colleagues who are developing really beautiful experiments in institutional analysis in Brazil won't be able to be there, uh, be here with us. But but Vandele has been um, uh, comes from Brazil and was studying with Sueli Rolnik, Peter Palpert, and many of the people at the Nucleo, which is a university site for um, really thinking through histories of institutional analysis, but also where practitioners from very different disciplines, psychoanalysts, um, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, art therapists, theorists, artists, um, various other kinds of social practitioners, social workers will come together and develop um, sort of really their own approaches. So it's very much like the FGLE or the SELFI, you know, this kind of a research group that's based in the university but attempting to make kind of changes in the social fabric. So um, Vandele has subsequently come to the UK and is working in a secondary school in Newham which is very much focused on um, getting kids into Oxford and Cambridge. So he'll be talking about <laughs> the distances between this really experimental side of education from his own experience at the Nucleo to coming to be the psychologist in residence at a really um, ambitious but um, kind of troubled school in that sense. Um, also, we'll be looking at, uh, in the 19th of March, which we already talked about, um, this kind of idea of the focus of the gallery or cultural institutions where this sort of institutional rhetoric of institutional change is often at play, but where the um, sort of tacit knowledges and also configurations um, of the organization are not really being addressed. So we'll be looking and talking with practitioners who are trying to do that sort of behind the scenes or across the scenes kind of work to um, develop an analysis of what are the blockages to doing that work um, and what are the possibilities. And then our final week is um, called Can an Institution Be Militant? And this is with Susanna Callow, who is um, <coughs> based in London and does really interesting work on a number of things related to these histories. She generally has been working a lot on the Sophie and the FGLE, these, these research groups. So we'll hear more about what happened when these practices went out into these different kinds of social settings, what kind of um, blockages they encounter and, and she's going to also then open the discussion up um, and sort of create some kind of way for us all to close and sort of think through this institution and other institutions the ways we might want them to become more militant mm -hmm. and ourselves within them perhaps. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's where we'll end. So, yeah. Yeah, like maybe it's important to say one thing about, yeah. you, know, you know, kind of touching on what you said about Brazil. Yeah. It's probably important to mention who we couldn't include. Yeah. Um, for really, really frustrating financial reasons. Mm -hmm. There's some really amazing and engaging work happening um, throughout the world in institutional analysis, especially institutional psychotherapy, um, that we frankly just didn't have the money <laughs> to access uh, a lot of these people. But it's worth highlighting that there's the Center for Felix Guattari, which is on theory and psychiatric practice, um, institutional psychotherapy that is in Montevideo, Uruguay, Santiago, Chile, and Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, there's a new book coming out um, by Cristobal Rojas uh, 
um, on Guatari in Santiago. So, so the year after the dictatorship ended, um, and the year before he passed away, Guatari was in Santiago um, with a lot of the people whom, the refugees whom he met at Labor that had just gone back and gave a series of talks and lectures. Um, so that, that book should be coming out, unfortunately only in Spanish <laughs> at the moment, um, but quite soon. Um, and also there's some really interesting work happening in Somaliland, um, specifically with Hussein Bolan. So Hussein Bolan is originally from Somaliland, studied psychiatry <coughs> in London, um, went on to lecture in Princeton um, in the States, but is, has an active engagement with the psychotherapeutic practice of Franz Fanon, and has since gone back to Somaliland and set up the Fanon College, um, where, where it's a kind of normal kind of pedagogical university, but he's also a practicing social therapist in a kind of Fanonian way. Um, and unfortunately, it's just too expensive for us to fly him here from Somalia. We're telling you about the series that after this. Yes, after yes. The successful fundraising. But we, we, we thought it would be, yeah, but then now we thought it would be useful to kind of open up for discussion or any questions that people have um, prior to maybe going to the pub. Um, <laughs> if people have questions about the series or about sort of what we've laid out as the underpinnings of institutional analysis, it would be great to know. Yeah. Can you sit down, finally? Sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you.